let me just tell you that Eric is a professor of sociology. He's the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU uh, right now. Um, he is the author of books including Modern Romance with Aziz Ansari, um, which I don't think he's going to talk about tonight, but maybe in Q&A we can if you have, need advice on that. Um, but, uh, and uh, Heat Wave, A Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago, which we have on sale uh, tonight. And he'll be sticking around afterwards, of course, to, to sign it as well. So um, we're, we're honored to have Eric here to talk tonight about climate change and the future of cities. Join me in giving him a big round of applause. Hi there. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I, f I hear myself now. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I was really worried that people weren't going to come, and then I told them to advertise me as the guy with the underwater drone. Um, <laughs> but I don't have an underwater drone at all. Um, the, I then had to come up with another strategy, which is that um, once I wrote this book with Aziz Ansari, I realized that um, if we tease that, people would sometimes come thinking Aziz was just going to show up. Um, like in, in San Francisco, you know, you can relate like the idea is like you're going to go to this folk band and Jerry Garcia is going to be there because he always plays with his folk band. Um, so I just want to welcome Aziz Ansari from, no, no, actually he's, he's not coming at all. I'm, so he would never even consider coming to do this with me. Um, so I'm pretty much on my own talking about climate change with no technological device other than the clicker. But um, let me get my face off of there. Um, I think we have a lot of stuff to talk about, and it will it'll probably be a little bit less um, jolly than, than an evening with Aziz, but maybe we'll do that another time. Um, climate change and, and the future of cities. Can anybody tell me um, where and when this uh, shot was taken? Sandy or Katrina? Russian River? Yeah, you said it there too, but you said it so quickly that it wasn't, it was going to ruin the whole, you know, <laughs> thing. So, so um, that was, that's San Jose two weeks ago. Um, and, and no one was talking storm of the century, right? That was a rainstorm in San Jose. So I just, I don't have that much more to say about this right now, but I want, I, I, you know, we're going to, what we're going to talk about today is the convergence of these two um, trends that you hear a lot about, rarely in unison, right? One is urbanization, and the other is climate change. I want to talk about the significance, and this is long now, and we're going to be kind of emphasizing more of the now than the long for a lot of it. Um, but I'm going to start talking towards the end about the long part, because what I want to try to persuade you tonight is that we have some incredibly consequential decisions we're going to make in the next few years about how we build the places that, that we inhabit, including this place. And when you hear a political leader talk about an infrastructure investment, I want you to, to start thinking about the infrastructures that we use in our day-to-day -day life and when they were built and how long they last. And then I want you to project forward what it will mean to build infrastructure for this coming period of time. Okay, so that, that's where we're going to get to the long questions. Um, I'm a social scientist. I'm here um, this year because I'm at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And so this um, chart that you see here, which I presume everybody in the room is familiar with, is actually a very strange chart to start a social science talk with. And I often have to explain it to my colleagues in social science. You know, many of the social sciences were built on this idea that there's something social that explains the world we live in, and because there's a social explanation, there's precisely not a natural explanation. So the, you know, economics and political science and sociology, they were built in some ways in opposition to studies of nature, which means when you see a chart that shows uh, you know, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, global temperatures, and you see that incredible spike, people sometimes call this the hockey stick graph, um, uh, it, it actually needs explanation in some quarters. It doesn't need explanation here, nor do I need to persuade you of why you should be concerned about this. The point is those two things are going up together. And you know, one of the reasons that there's this kind of group of us who has tried to make the case that this is an urgent matter is because when we think about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, when we think about our, 
our sources of energy, our, the ways we consume things. Uh, the conversation that we're having in, in, in policy terms is about whether in the next 20 or 40 or 50 or 100 years we're going to be following the red line up above, which gets us to uh, a, a level of heating uh, that would really be catastrophic, or whether we're going to be on the blue line, which would just be really fucking terrifying, but not totally catastrophic. Um, we have serious stuff that we're going to be managing, and, and, and that's what I want, you know, want us to, to start focusing on. The issue is that the, you know, the real danger we have right now is um, that we have to start this, this project of, of mitigating, of reducing our consumption of greenhouse gases. But the problem is that if this clicker that I'm holding in my hand suddenly got converted into a magic button, and right this second, by pressing the forward slide, in addition to getting you to the next image, I also could stop all global greenhouse gas emissions. That would be an awesome technology uh, that, that you would be, feel very proud to have witnessed up there with the underwater drone. Um, but as awesome as it would be to do that, it actually wouldn't do much to stop rising temperatures or sea levels for the next century or so because we have baked so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere already that no matter what we do, um, we can't just mitigate. We, we, we have to mitigate, but, but we have to do more. That wasn't there in the practice round. Um, let's not worry about it right now. Um, we're already at a moment where we're seeing a spike in uh, extreme weather events uh, that are consequential, that, that, that kill many people, that force uh, waves of migration. We're seeing this all over the world. Um, this is just a couple year period that happened to be two of the hottest years in history. Then 2016 came around and was even hotter. So we're seeing a, a rising incidence of, of droughts and heat waves and hurricanes and, and things that we have to worry about. We're beginning to see uh, serious displacement and migration uh, and emerging conflicts that are related to the spike in extreme weather. Um, and you should know that our last president, uh, before he left office, uh, issued a memorandum uh, in, in which he, he made it clear what the implications for U.S. national security were from climate change. This is not something that uh, the president was out on a limb doing. Uh, the Pentagon has been sounding the same note. Uh, they think of climate change as a threat multiplier. Uh, and, and that continues to be the case, that, that climate change is a, is a factor that, that, that increases the, the possibility, the probability of dangerous conflicts in many places around the world. So it's a, it's a serious thing at the global level. Um, and probably many of you here tonight know that it, climate change also is a local concern, not just because of the image of San Jose, um, but these are the walls that keep much of San Francisco dry. Uh, this is around the Embarcadero, so you know, not too far from here. And we don't get to see what that looks like very often, but that's what our walls uh, in this city look like today. Um, we all know about the Oroville Dam now. None of us knew about the Oroville Dam a few weeks ago. But that's one of the things that's going to start to happen with more frequency, is that systems and structures that held everything together that we took for granted uh, will suddenly flash up as being vulnerable. Um, and we will have to deal with them. And in some cases, we'll have to deal with them in very urgent ways. Sometimes we'll have the luxury of time, um, but not that much time. What I'm saying right now is that we are about to enter a process um, that people who think about the climate a lot call either adaptation or transformation. We're going to have to change the, the way we live, and we're going to have to change the places that we live. Adaptation is kind of a, a soft and fuzzy word. It, may, it sounds kind of innocent. You know, we're just going to kind of gradually shift the way we do things and build things to, to, to live in this new world of extremes. Transformation is probably more accurate for, the, for what we're going to have to do, and I, I hope I can persuade you of that soon. And so what I, what I mostly want to talk to you about tonight is what it will mean to adapt or transform cities. And the way that I want to do that um, is um, I, I, I want to begin with this note of caution, and that is when we think about investing in structures and infrastructures, when we think about building and rebuilding cities, we're talking about spending real resources. Um, it is extraordinarily expensive to build new subway systems and new seawalls, uh, new high kinds of high-rise buildings, new flood management systems, 
Uh, it is extraordinarily expensive. And so as a preliminary, let me tell you that as we enter into this conversation, you should know that, that one of the great dangers of dealing with climate change through adaptation projects is that it will inevitably increase the problem of environmental justice the problem of environmental injustice to a level that I think we haven't really taken seriously yet. Um, and when you read about uh, international diplomacy around climate and you hear about negotiations between the wealthier countries in the world and the poor countries in the world, there's issues about mitigation, who's going to reduce consumption of greenhouse gases, but there's also this conversation about a fund where wealthier countries will put in money to help poor countries in the world adapt. Um, and th that's generally what's the most vulnerable um, uh, in, in these changes of the negotiation, of negoti in negotiation. So I want you to bear in mind as we go through this thing, you're going to see a lot of expensive ideas. Um, and anytime you see an expensive idea, know that implementing it is going to be exacerbating inequality issues. Okay, off we go. So I have a, um, a crew with me from Chicago tonight. Um, I've invited some old friends who I grew up with who've come, come to the Bay Area. And so what I wanted to do, because I grew up in Chicago, and Chicago is a place where we actually got some early warning signs about the possible dangers of living in a hotter world. And so to, to introduce you to the way that I think about this issue, I want to bring you back to Chicago in 1995. So um, Chicago gets hot in the summer, but this is a summer where it was unusually hot. The temperature in July hit about 106 degrees, and the heat index, which is like the wind chill, these are really foreign concepts to people who live in the Bay Area where the weather's always perfect, I know, but, but the heat index, which tells you what a typical person feels, uh, hit about 126. And, and cities, uh, in San Francisco, people start saying, oh, like that, it, once you get above like 75, people start freaking out, like, God, how do they live? Um, but the thing about Chicago is that Chicago, like, like most urban areas, is, is what's called a heat island. Um, cities are heat islands because uh, all of the, the concrete, the pavement, the buildings, they attract the sun, and all of that pollution that we put out from cars and from industry traps the heat. And why that's significant is that at night, when the outlying areas cool down, city air traps the heat, and it tends to be significantly warmer. So you don't get the natural cooling that can keep people alive. And in Chicago, the, the nights were also very, very hot. So what happened in 1995 is that uh, the city set its record for energy consumption. That's now become pretty mundane. Anytime it's hot, cities set their records for energy consumption. Um, it used to be the case that one of the things that kind of helped us understand and appreciate being American and living in a place like this is that we could rely on our energy working, on our infrastructure working when we really needed it. I think now, in many cities, we just expect that the infrastructure and the power is going to break down. Um, it certainly is what happened in Chicago. These are uh, emergency workers. I just stole this image from a television station in Chicago, which is why the image is so bad, so bear with me, and please don't sue me if you're watching this uh, ABC. Um, but these are guys trying to spray down a substation. Guess, guess what didn't work? Um, about 250,000 households in Chicago lost access to power when it felt like it was 126. And as you know, if you live in a city when you don't have power, uh, if you live in a high-rise building, you can't pump water up to high floors. The elevators don't go up and down. The, power, you know, the lights are out. Obviously, it's very dangerous for, for older people and frail people in particular. Um, about 3,000 uh, hydrants in Chicago were opened at the same time. This is before they had the spray that could... Uh, you know, release a small amount of water, and so many hydrants were open at the same time that um, entire neighborhoods lost water pressure in addition to high rises, again, 126 degrees. Um, the transit system in Chicago broke down. Uh, the the uh, plates on the bridges were expanding, so the bridges couldn't open and close. Uh, the rails on train lines uh, were moving just enough that it was very dangerous for the trains to travel quickly when the power was out. You couldn't get the traffic lights working. So you had gridlock in Chicago, um, which is significant because thousands of people needed uh, emergency care because they were overheating in their homes. Um, in fact, um, uh, so many people in Chicago needed to get emergency care from ambulances that half of the hospitals in Chicago had to go on bypass status which means that they closed their doors and refused to take in any more emergency patients because they literally could not handle 
the load. And the problem in Chicago in 1995 is that there was no centralized system for figuring out which hospitals were open and which hospitals were closed. So the ambulance would go to a place and knock on the door and be told that they couldn't come in, and they'd have to drive to another nearby hospital, the odds of which it was also closed. And remember, they're driving through gridlock traffic. So you have this incredible backup of the ambulances in a situation where people need urgent care to prevent the heat-related illness from turning into something truly deadly. But that didn't work. So the reason um, I wound up writing this book um, about the heat wave is that more than 700 people died from a heat event that lasted just about two and a half to three days. Um, thousands more were hospitalized. And this is truly an amazing event. Um, what puzzled me when I first learned about it, I was actually, I just moved to Berkeley. I'd come to Berkeley to, to do a PhD in sociology, and I started reading about this event. And it was, it was a strange thing to learn about scientifically because we actually have pretty sophisticated climate models that predict how much mortality, and how much morbidity you would get under different conditions. And, and, and the kind of climate health world was really freaked out about this event because they kept saying, this was so much worse than our models tell us it should be. Something else must be going on, but what was it? And they kind of released this you know, uh, report published in the American Journal of Public Health saying, you know, we don't know what's going on. So I started doing what I call, came to call a social autopsy, kind of like opening up the skin of the city in the same way that a medical examiner opens up the skin when they're going to do a, a, a physical autopsy to try to figure out kind of what, what broke down and what made the event so deadly. And there are a lot of things that, that I, I do in the book that I won't tell you about, but one thing I want to mention you know, quickly because it's going to be central to our discussion here um, is I was really interested in this question about why some places in Chicago were so much more vulnerable than other places. And, and what could I learn about um, what happened in the heat wave from looking at this? And so the, you know, the first thing you do when you're a sociologist is you map stuff, especially when you're working in a city. And if you know anything about the city of Chicago, you'll see that the red areas on this map are um, important because those are what the neighborhoods are in what's called the, the Black Belt, the historically African-American neighborhoods in Chicago on the south side and the west side. They are disproportionately poor. Chicago is almost perfectly segregated, so they're almost entirely African-American in many places. And this is the kind of map that is completely predictable. Like if, you, if, you, if a disaster is coming to a big city, you expect to see a map like this. So that was important to, to discover, but it wasn't scientifically interesting to find a pattern like that. So what I then did is I tried to flip that map and look at a different question, which was, could I understand which neighborhoods in Chicago proved to be the most resilient? Which were the places that actually had the lowest death rates? And no one had asked that question, but it turned out to be really fascinating because it was, a, it was a very mixed set of neighborhoods. And part of what was interesting is that three of the neighborhoods that had incredibly low death rates should have been in the red. They're entirely African-American, perfectly segregated, disproportionately poor, a lot of vulnerable people. And it kind of didn't make sense on paper that you would have such high survival rates in places that should have been so vulnerable. So I wanted to look closer. And I went back to Chicago, I went back home, and I started looking very closely at which neighborhoods had done well and which hadn't done well. And I was especially attuned to uh, neighborhoods that were right next to each other, pairs of neighborhoods that looked statistically very similar, but that had very different experiences in the event. So this is a neighborhood on the south side of the city called Englewood, which is characteristic of a certain kind of Chicago area that had been massively depopulated in the decades leading up to 1995. Less than half of the population from 1950 was there. It had a lot of abandoned lots, uh, a lot of empty buildings, <clears throat> a lot of tall grass, a depleted commercial infrastructure. And it's possible to look at this and think like, oh, that's a green neighborhood. But that's not a healthy green neighborhood. That's a, a, a green environment that actually discourages people from going out of their homes and into public life, especially older people who'd be more likely to be alone and frail. There's not much to do in a neighborhood like this, unless you're dealing drugs, in which case that ecology is great for you because if the cops come, you just drop your stuff in the grass and run. And that's basically how people treated these neighborhoods. That's a neighborhood across the street from Englewood, which on paper looks almost identical. It's called Auburn Gresham, entirely African-American, very poor. And what's so striking about Auburn Gresham is that they didn't have that loss of population. The um, 
residential infrastructure was very similar to what it was 30 or 40 years before. The neighborhood organizational structure, very similar. The commercial infrastructure, relatively robust. More like a poor neighborhood you find in, in New York City than in a neighborhood like, the, these, like Englewood from before. And what I discovered is that the death rate in the first neighborhood you saw, Englewood, was 10 times higher than the death rate in Auburn Gresham. And moreover, the life expectancy in, in Englewood, this neighborhood, the life expectancy from living here is five years lower than the life expectancy of living across the street. And I came to believe that there was something that, that social scientists had failed to appreciate about what organizes the world we live in, and I came to call it social infrastructure. The, the network, the set of places and institutions that shape the way we interact with each other. When it works well, it, it can help people connect in a daily way, so you get longer life expectancy, you get a stronger sense of cohesion and connection and community, and when it doesn't work well, it actually promotes very unhealthy ways of living, the kind of living where you stay inside, you, it engenders distrust, it makes you more isolated, and, and less likely to survive an extreme event. So, as it happens, you know, this kind of insight was missing in the public conversation about the heat wave of 1995. Could I just ask really quickly, could you raise your hand high if you have strong memories of the great Chicago heat wave of 1995? I want everyone to look around the room at the moment because it's really telling, you know, first of all, that my friends from Chicago are either very shy people or they don't remember it either, which is doubly embarrassing as I realize it now because I think I've sent a book to each one of them already. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, we don't know about this event. It was a non-event, despite the fact that it really is one of the great disasters. But one of the reasons it's a non-event is because the city of Chicago really treated this as a public relations crisis, even more than as a public health hazard. And one reason I know this is because this is the, the city never held public hearings about what happened. This is the only major report published by the city. It was a, a mayor's commission. Could I just ask, does anybody see anything funny about this report cover? There's a snowflake on the cover, which is a very odd thing for a report about why 700 people died in a heat wave. Anyone see something that's missing? Like, you would expect it to be there, and it isn't. It's a, how about a word, a concept? Disasters would be a good one. Anything else more specific in that genre? How about heat wave? Thank you very much. So this is a report about why so many people died in a heat wave from a city that refused to hold public hearings, and it's got a snowflake, and it doesn't have the concept heat wave. And it should have the should have that too. It should have. But this is a report that was designed to hide rather than to show, right? This was a publication meant to disappear something which is a hard, it's the kind of thing we associate with like Central America. But I wanna, uh, I wanna argue that this is kind of how, it's a very nice metaphor for how we manage climate issues for a long time in this country. And in that sense, it's part of a genre. My book came out in 2002. It was a really exciting moment for me. You know, it was on fresh air and Malcolm Gladwell wrote an article about it and I did all this media and I felt like I am now a social scientist who's changing the world and people will understand this issue in a way they never would have before. I'm gonna make a difference with my pen. And then in 2003, there was a heat wave in Europe and 70,000 people, more than 70,000 people died and not a single European political official paid a major price for it because they, to a person said, nothing like this has ever happened before. How could we have known that a heat wave could be so deadly? So I was totally crushed. It was, you know, made me think I had to work a lot harder. And we all have to work harder, actually, it turns out. We all have to work harder on these issues because it's very hard to convey a sense of their seriousness and the urgency. Um, what I do know is if we, what I learned from that Chicago story and from the European story is that we're facing these incredible threats. And I'll tell you something else, but just to go back to this for a second, what's especially scary for me about the European heat wave story is that we know it mostly as a French story because the French were very uh, open about the fact that so many people were dying. So it was covered as a French heat wave. It was only later when we looked at the epidemiological data that we learned that in fact, there were tens of thousands of deaths across Europe. Um, but here's what's haunting for me. The, the heat wave in Europe lasted about three weeks. And France has about 60 million people. And, or did in 2003. 
What I learned when I looked at the numbers is that the death rate in France from a heat wave that lasted three weeks was basically the same as the death rate in Chicago for a heat wave that lasted two and a half or three days. And it raises for me this question of, you know, what would happen to Chicago or Milwaukee or Philadelphia or Washington or New York or Phoenix or Los Angeles or even San Francisco if a heat wave like the one that hit Europe in 2003 just happened to hit here? And those are the kinds of things that we now have to be thinking about. Okay, so then I moved to New York. And does anybody recognize this? That's Sandy, right? There, there, there's Sandy, not San Jose. That's actually Sandy, about a thousand, <laughs> thousand, if that was San Jose, it would be really weird. Um, about a thousand miles wide. Actually, when Sandy hit New York, it was a combination of several storms. Um, but you know, when Sandy hit New York, it was not a hurricane. Um, my friends in New York talk about having dodged a bullet. But I want to show you what it means, what it looks like to dodge a bullet. Okay. So it, it's hard to picture a heat wave. You close your eyes and try to think about what a heat wave looks like, and you probably draw a blank, or you see kids playing in a fire hydrant or something. But you have an image of Sandy, I bet, because there's an iconog iconography for it. And this is the great image, right? This is um, this lower Manhattan out of power, and I live in the zone that had no power, and I had a 92-year-old uh, father-in-law at the time who was in a wheelchair who lived on the 10th floor of a building that was across the street from where the power was on, but he did not have power. Um, and this was a stunning thing that happened. The, 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 the um, wave of water that came into the east side of Manhattan was about 14 and a half feet high, and the wall at the substation on the Lower East Side on 14th Street. It was about 14 feet high, and the equipment was on the ground level. It wasn't elevated, and so as soon as the water breached that wall, it was out. And what was amazing to me, any of you guys spend time in New York? Can you raise your hand if you spend time in New York? Okay, so anyone ever lived in New York City? Okay, New Yorkers, back me up if you think I'm right about this. But, so I've lived in Manhattan for about 15 years, and the worldview when you live in Manhattan is like, okay, some terrible shit's gonna happen, but, if there's ever a situation where there was no power, they would find a way to keep it on where we live, and they'd like shut it off in the Bronx or something like that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that with pride or anything. I don't feel good about that, but you, you know, there's this feeling when you live in San Francisco, and you're like, you know, you live in a great, like a superstar city, and the feeling you have is like, they're going to take care of us in our neighborhood, because we're the awesome people. And, and I think a lot of people in New York really felt that way, right? We, you know, come on, we're in a bar, you could admit it. You, you know, like it's that sense. Like I, you know, I've probably half of you have a house in New Zealand or something. Like everybody's got a way of, of, getting, of getting out. So that was the thing is you were down there and you, there was no getting out. You were just in the dark and the power wasn't coming on. And you talk to people and say, you know, when is the power coming on? And they would say the power's coming on maybe next week. And you would say, there must be some kind of mistake. But there wasn't a mistake, except for in the way that we built things. It turns out that uh, Manhattan is, wasn't the only place that lost power. This is Long Island. Uh, about 8 million households in the country lost power, more than a million people uh, on Long Island as, uh, as well. And um, in Long Island, as in many American communities, there's a technology that we use to sustain the power grid. Um, it's called the pole. You probably are familiar with the pole. And, um, we have these electrical wires and we put them on top of poles and you know what we keep right on top of the electrical wires? Trees. Trees. Yes, you guys are sharp. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and what happens routinely on a windy day? Uh, not even a superstorm, but the trees go down and they fall. I mean, it's, no, it's not surprising when the power grid goes down. So we know that um, the Long Island Power Authority had a board meeting a few days before Sandy hit. It was a long scheduled board meeting. Sandy was on its way. We knew it was coming, um, but they had other things to discuss. So they talked for, according to the minutes of the meeting, I think it's either 37 or 57 seconds about pre-Sandy planning, things like pruning the trees to make sure that, that they don't go down. But they, you know, so if you don't think about these things a long time in advance, you have problems, but even if you don't think about things in a short time in advance, you can compound them. Um, the subway, flooded like a bathtub. And what's truly strange about this image <clears throat> is look closely, New Yorkers, it's 86th Street, which was completely dry. 
And so this is a horrifying image because it shows you like we, we built a lot of stuff underground without thinking about the possibility of flooding. And it's very hard to keep water from going underground because it's not just entering into the stations. It goes through all the grids. Like when, when you walk in New York or Chicago, or I, I don't know the, the BART system well enough to know how the, how the um, circulation system works. But you know, if there are grids on the ground, the water goes right under them. So this is scary. But here's a cool story about New York City. The city and the state were actually very concerned about climate change, and they were concerned about hurricanes and extreme weather events. Now, you don't need to be concerned about climate change to be concerned about extreme weather, but there tends to be a strong relationship between them. Um, it may be very interesting in this, with the current president we have to see whether they're interested in sparing us from storms, um, even though they don't believe in climate change. I guess the early signs of like, getting rid of all the weather generating data uh, and technology tell us we probably shouldn't be optimistic on that front. But um, New York was really concerned about it. So here's what they did. Before um, Sandy hit, they evacuated the cars from the subway system and moved them to higher ground. They went in underground and they pulled out as many of the electrical wires that they could so that when the salt water came into the system, it wouldn't corrode the lines all that much. And the water came in as predicted. They got it right away. They pumped it out. They replaced the lines. In about five days, much of the system was up and running again. Okay? And every day that the New York City subway system is down, there's X billion dollars of economic damage. Okay? It's an expensive thing to get wrong. Now, across the river, anyone here from Jersey? <laughs> yeah, there's like 20 times more people <laughs> from Jersey here, but nobody's admitting it. So, so it's just. Because what happened is that half the people who said they were from Manhattan actually grew up in, like, Teaneck. And they just don't want to say it. So now they've already raised their hand as Manhattan, and they're embarrassed. But, OK, so here's what happens in New Jersey. The governor doesn't believe much in climate change. He's not inclined to think it's a serious thing. He doesn't um, do a lot of work prepping uh, the city the cities around the New Jersey or the state to deal with a, a, an emerging crisis. And so as Sandy approaches, the New Jersey Transit leaves its cars right next to the river. And they have $110 million of flooding, destroying the cars, which means not only that the taxpayers of New Jersey and, ladies and gentlemen, all of us in this room, wind up paying for the new cars, but also it takes much longer for New Jersey to bounce back and get the commute right again. So everybody suffers from that situation, right? You didn't even have to order the bridge closed. Um, the, the transit system went down, right? So that's a, so that's a story about um, what, it, what can you do if you take seriously climate threats before they happen, right? It's not, not the whole big story about mitigation, but just little things that you might not think about, that actually, make, like, it makes a difference what the leadership is, okay? But don't let me get carried away with the idea that New York did everything right, because this is a billion dollar uh, subway station that went up at the bottom of the battery about a year before Sandy hit. And guess what did not survive Sandy? Those are my colleagues at NYU. Um, as it happens, the health infrastructure for um, much of Manhattan is built along the East River. Um, several hospitals are clustered together there. Um, it turns out that they're also completely vulnerable to floodwaters. Uh, we learned that the hard way in Sandy. So um, the regulation was that um, you had to have your generators, your backup generators, on the roof, but you couldn't have your fuel exposed. So you put your fuel in the basement where people wouldn't be able to breathe it in. So when the floodwaters came into the basement, they mixed with the fuel and destroyed the computer systems and tens of thousands of laboratory animals who were there for medical testing. And the hospitals were really in trouble. And this is a, I love this image. This is um, a scene from the neonatal um, NICU uh, at NYU Hospital. So they, they managed to, um, in a situation where there was no power in the hospital. They carried these premature babies down uh, eight flights of stairs, pumping air into their lungs with paper bags, removed them out into a hurricane, um, into an ambulance which went through flooded streets to go uptown, and not a single child died, which is amazing, right? And, and the moral of the story is that if we screw up the planning in advance, we need heroes to get us out of these situations. And sometimes we have them, and often we don't. So how do we start to think about um, climate security for a world that's getting hotter? 
How do, how do we begin to put this on the agenda of the kinds of things that cities need to think about, really regardless of who the president is? Um, there are some places on Earth that won't work if you don't have a wall. You need some kind of gate to keep the water out because the cities just are too low and the water's already too high. So if you've been to Venice, you know that Venice is building the system they call Moses, a series of sea gates that's going up because Venice is going under. This is London, um, which would be a lot wetter were it not for this hard system. And after Sandy happened, um, many people suggested that New York City build this. It's very funny, so I, I, this is an amazing thing, Otto, but it turns out that Otto, like everybody else, forgot about Staten Island, which is like <laughs> right over here. Poor Staten Island gets no respect. So this is Staten Island here, that's the Verrazano Bridge, and people said, we need to build a giant gate to protect, protect you know, lower Manhattan, where the money is, <clears throat> where the infrastructure is, where the, people, where the people are. No, this is how disaster planning works. It's like triage, you know, what can you save? Who's, and, and this is gonna get very serious, because we're gonna start to be think, we're gonna start thinking about what are the places that we're going to protect? Who are the people we're going to protect? How are we going to make those decisions? This is going to get very interesting for us in our lifetimes, hopefully. So, um, so people said, we'll build a, uh, this gate here. But the thing about the gate is it's got a lot of appeal, and it's also got a lot of problems. The appeal is problem solved, right? We don't have to worry about the storm coming in because we've got these gates around the city. Well, the bad news is, first of all, you can't wall in the entire United States and you can't wall in the entire world. So you're gonna to have to make some choices. As it happens, when the water smashes into that gate and the sediment smashes into that gate, it doesn't just powderize, it goes to Staten Island and it goes to Brooklyn and Queens and Connecticut. And I don't know about San Francisco, but New York is a pretty litigious place. And when you have sediment and water that is now threatening the viability of other dense settlements, they tend to sue. And so you can't put a thing up without, you know, real struggle, okay? There's another problem, which is it's incredibly expensive. And another problem, which is how high are you gonna build it? If you start to take into consideration various scenarios of sea level rise plus the storm surge that comes on top of it, you can find yourself building walls so that we're standing here, but we don't see much of Marin. And I don't know that we want to do that in San Francisco. Another thing is the walls like, that, we, that we make, these sea gates, are open most of the time, so the water flows in and out. The notion is you just close them when there's extreme weather. But if we start to get serious sea level rise and more and more extreme weather, we're talking about keeping those gates closed. And it turns out there's an entire ecosystem that lies behind there, right? The Hudson River, the East River. And you do real damage if you just build a wall. Take that however you want, by the way. <laughs> so, um, so that's a strategy for dealing with climate change that people talk about as kind of armoring, defending. That's one of the things that we can do in the face of, of the weather that's coming, is we can armor, try to keep the water out, try to keep the heat out. Another thing that we can do, and this is very tricky, is we can retreat. We say, like, you know what? We should never have settled here in the first place. This is a very dangerous place to build. Let's start to move people and move structures to different areas. Here's a long view problem. There's about 800 million people in the world who live in coastal or delta cities that are less than 10 feet above sea water, sea, sea level. And as we get sea level rise and as we see an incidence of, of um, emerging weather increase, we'll have to face these really tough questions about what's going to happen to these 800 million plus people and the very expensive structures and infrastructures that make their lives possible. And that is not gonna be an easy thing to manage, let me tell you. That is gonna be a very serious problem that our generation or future generations has to deal with. So normally we think about retreat from places like the Marshall Islands or the Maldives. But after Sandy, a group of beachfront communities in Staten Island lobbied the state for hundreds of millions of dollars to be bought out of their homes to relocate to higher ground. And it's an incredible thing, right? Because these are the Staten Island. So this is a white, you know, working class and middle class community that tends to vote Republican and not believe that climate change is real. And also 
Outside of fire and police, they don't think the government can do that much to help. And now they're working with government to try to help them get through climate change. So it's an amazing thing. But it's a haunting thing also because they got the money. They were able to pull it through. But where do you say no? As soon as those three neighborhoods got money, a bunch of other neighborhoods said, we want it too. And then Bloomberg came in and said, whoa, 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 we can't be buying people out here because think about all the New Yorkers who, who would want this. So we should build more expensive structures and just build like high tech places on the water. Um, but then you give the beach to very wealthy people and people don't want to sell their houses or walk away from their houses on the beach to turn it over to the next wave of real estate developers. So that's a tough area. This is not like a long-term thing solely. Uh, the state of Louisiana issued this map. Um, you might not think of the state of Louisiana as a leader when it comes to uh, climate change warning, but look at all these areas in red that are projected to be underwater in the next 50 years. You know, that's our problem. No, ma you know, no matter who they vote for, red or blue, they've got a situation. And similarly, the highlighted areas are places in the United States that continually reapply for disaster relief funding. And at some point you say, actually, maybe it doesn't make sense to rebuild there. But go tell that to people in New Orleans. It's tricky. So a third strategy is to accommodate, to kind of let the water, let the water in let the climate come, let's find a way to live with water. In some cases, this can be very useful. There's places on Earth like Singapore, um, the Netherlands, California, that actually could use the water. So when it rains and there's flooding, you know, rather than just building a park, you build a park that can convert, as this one can, into a, a water storage basin that then diverts the water underground where it can be recycled or reused for a, a number of different purposes. In Singapore, it's a matter of life and death. Um, there's just not enough water and it's not coming. And in California, it could be too. So there are a lot of places that are trying to figure out, you know, what are the ways that we can live with the, the water that's coming, the heat that's coming. Those are very tough questions. I'd love to talk about that as well. There's some places on Earth, like the Rockaway Peninsula, um, which you can see here. Otto got that one right. Um, where it's very hard to just accommodate and let the water in because it's incredibly vulnerable. That's the kind of thing that we used to call a barrier island, right? But it turns out we, 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 we built on all of our barrier islands. We settled them. And the government actually subsidized settlement of those areas, right? The government built infrastructure. The government built housing. The government uh, subsidized flood insurance, right? So we, we, we had a, a, a strategic policy of doing it. The Rockaways, by the way, are gorgeous. If you've never been out there, um, it's a beautiful place. Like, you kind of can't believe you're on the beach. You've got this gorgeous boardwalk. That's what the boardwalk looked like after Sandy. Um, that's what happens to a barrier island when, when a storm hits. And, and when I went out to do um, so reporting for a story I did for The New Yorker right after Sandy, I discovered you know, that remarkably, as in Chicago, where social infrastructure really mattered, in the neighborhoods of New York City, um, when the systems and the infrastructures broke down, as they inevitably do, the social infrastructure really became crucial. So here is a surf club where people really knew the neighborhood well and knew their neighbors well and had a terrific network and were managed to convert their facility from a place where people went to surf on the weekends to a place that served more than 10,000 people in the Rockaways, got them connected to plumbers and electricians and got them food and got them cleaning supplies and helped them get their pharmaceuticals and did an extraordinary amount of work. Um, this is a, a, a youth employment agency and a, a kind of a youth support uh, agency in Red Hook. It's called the Red Hook Initiative, which also completely converted into a, a neighborhood relief center. And what I learned as I, I, I looked through um, different neighborhoods in New York and that what was subsequently confirmed by more quantitative research is that the neighborhoods that had very strong social infrastructure and strong social capital fared better in Sandy and also recovered more quickly than places where the levels of social capital were lower and people had higher levels of estrangement. And so as we think about the climate, I want to emphasize that we shouldn't just be thinking about these big structures that we build. We should also be thinking about the social structures that organize our lives. That's true for disasters and it's true every day. 
I want to wrap up and make sure we have time for a conversation. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about a remarkable thing that happened in New York and that happened to me in my work life um, after Sandy. Um, it happened that um, at the time there was, a big, there was a very bitter fight in Congress about whether to provide emergency funds to the region that was affected by Sandy. You probably are familiar with these political debates where people get very ideological about who's responsible and who should pay. But after a fight, um, Congress appropriated about $50 billion to the region affected by Sandy for, for relief. And the president, Obama, um, had a commission that, that was working on the San Sandy project. He appointed Sean Donovan, the HUD secretary, to, to head this commission. And they pulled aside a couple billion dollars for a project they called Rebuild by Design, which was meant to um, generate ideas and also funding for innovative <clears throat> infrastructure projects for the region. They said, basically, after Sandy, what we typically do when there's a disaster in this country is we say, we're going to build it back. Right? We're going to build back what we lost. But that doesn't make sense anymore. Right? We, are, we no longer have the luxury of just building back what we had before. Actually, we have federal regulations that required <laughs> Uh, cities and states to build back exactly what was there before and nothing better, so the policy had to be changed. But now the idea was, we're going to set aside a couple of billion dollars, we're going to have this international design competition, and we're going to generate exciting ways to think about infrastructure projects. And they, I had written this article um, about Sandy, and the White House had read it, and we had done a bunch of public events at my institute, and they came to me and said, you know, we'd like you to be the research director for this event, and we want to have you do it at your institute in New York. So we said, Sure. Um, even though we really had no idea we were doing it first, we kind of built the airplane while we were flying it. And it was an amazing thing because we had these design teams of engineers and architects and landscape architects and climate scientists and social scientists. And my job for three months was to show them around the region and to identify needs and possibilities, um, vulnerabilities, things that we could do together. And this is a scene from a, a day we spent uh, in Red Hook. There's a three-month research process that all the teams had to go through. They came to the project without a plan. They just came as a team that was selected for their excellence and achievement. About 150 teams applied, and we picked 10 finalists. Three months of research. They did three months of civic participation, talking to different stakeholders from community organizations and residents of public housing buildings to mayors and governors and small business owners. So really, you know, not just coming into communities and saying, here's what you need, but listening. Um, then selecting sites and spending three months designing things. And the way I want to wrap up is by just showing you the ideas for one of the winning projects that came out of this, um, which has a really dramatic uh, uh, idea for, for how we would do New York differently. You remember this image, right? Yeah. New York without power, lower Manhattan without power. And these one team from uh, Bjarke Engels, who's a very prominent uh, young Danish architect in a group called The Big Group, was, you know, we want to make sure that New York looks like this next time there's a storm that is like Sandy, right? How do, we, how do we make New York look like this? And so they came up with a project that they called for a while The Big U. And if you look at that kind of yellow illuminated line around here, think of that as, you know, like a cursive U from a third grader learning cursive. Um, that, that the idea was to build something like a protective wall around, around lower Manhattan, but not exactly what you think of when you think of a wall. And it really needed it. Um, I told you, you know, I've emphasized that inequality is an issue around climate change adaptation, and some people are, are more exposed than others, but, but we're all exposed in some ways. Like, we all are affected by water. We all have to breathe, so it's not like you can opt out of climate change. And this is a building, a very um, expensive building in Tribeca, um, I have good friends who live you know, next door to this. It flooded. Uh, the garage attendant who was trying to save the cars of the clients uh, died because the water came in so quickly. Um, you know, really serious suffering and catastrophe. And, and one of the things that Big U said is we want to build a series of compartments, um, our version of what would be a wall around this loop in lower Manhattan, around this U, um, each chain, you know, varying by neighborhood, that would, that would keep that scene from happening. So if you've walked around the Hudson recently on the west side, you know that that white wall doesn't exist. It's kind of like a sculpture, that concept. But it's also actually a seawall. So they said, could we, could we blow up the notion of a wall and actually create a, a, a series of water management systems that would 
really beautify the riverfront and not only protect people from a storm, but also make this part of New York more pleasant to walk on every day. And there's no reason why you know, the west side of Manhattan can't look like this, so that on a day like Sandy, instead of the scene with the cars, that's what you got. The, the guy's walking is probably a little bit glib. But um, other than that, it's, it's not impossible to do something like that, right? And so that was the, the, the west side, and this is the lower east side, which had even more catastrophic flooding and far higher level of vulnerability. Um, and so I live like right in the center of Greenwich Village, and my, my NYU is right there, and I started noticing this thing, which is, has anyone here ever been for a run in New York City in Lower Manhattan? Anyone ever gone jogging in Lower Manhattan? Okay, so if you've ever jogged in Lower Manhattan, not Central Park, you, you go to the west side on the Hudson, right? And the reason you go to the west side is because this is, this is what happens when you go for a run on the Lower East Side. It, it's the kind of run that makes you very happy to live in San Francisco. I have to pause every few minutes to get water, so I just put those in. Okay, so it's a really ugly landscape. It's a very gray landscape on the Lower East Side, and um, it's a poor area. And the, uh, the Big U also had a compartment for this area that involved creating, again, a, a protective layer on the river, but now the, the East River looks like this. It's a, a bridging berm, a sloped park right, where the stairs and the, and the green space are protecting people from water. But also, think about that run that we just took together. It would be much nicer for people to use that riverfront if it looked like this all the time. And the idea here is we are about to embark on this program of spending billions and ultimately trillions of dollars on something called climate security. And if you think about homeland security, as a political project and an architectural project. You think about urban design in the age of homeland security. Think about the money we spent on homeland security. It gets exponential if you throw in the wars. We're going to make a comparable kind of investment in climate security in the course of the next several decades. And if we just build to wall out the bad weather, we're going to have a very ugly environment. But we can use this moment of climate security and building infrastructure to build things that keep us safe during a crisis, but also make our lives better every day. And that was a, a fundamental goal, like at the root of this rebuild by design idea was, let's be attentive to issues of inequality, and let's make sure that when we design things, we're designing things that aren't just good for keeping us from a hurricane, but also make daily life better. So we get not just the reduced death rate, but also the five years of life expectancy, right? We want both of those things to work. And I'll tell you something, that, that's kind of a fantasy, but I like to put that up there. Don't, don't expect that. So here's a cool thing about this. Um, that Big U project was funded. It's gotten about $700 million of funding so far. Um, it, it needs more to do the whole thing. But in my version of the way the world works, if there's two different parts of lower Manhattan that want the money, and one is on the kind of Greenwich Village, Tribeca side, and the others on the Lower East Side, which has this thick concentration of public housing and Chinatown. In the way that I teach kind of the sociology of power, the West Side gets the money, right? But because of the political leaders who happened to be in power when this was allocated, the funds for the first tranche of money is going to the East, the Lower East Side where the vulnerability is, where you can actually address inequality. But that's an arbitrary thing, right? If you have a certain president and a certain governor and a certain mayor, and they're aligned and they think, you know, when we spend federal money, we need to deal with inequality, right? And we need to enhance the quality of life for people who don't have a, as much of a chance, you get a spending decision like that. If you have a, a imagine a different political leadership you could very easily have the money go to the people who already have, right? So Mar-a-Lago is going to be safe, but these guys won't be. Last thing I want to, sh I want to share with you. We, the, the project gets funded on the Lower East Side. There's these communities that are there. And let's go back to our inequality theme. So we have this beautiful vision of this park, slope park land that's going to make being on the Lower East Side feel better all the time. And we built this project through stakeholder meetings, 
where people articulate their sense of what they want. Right? They give us a fantasy for what it could look like, and we work with them, and, we, and they get it. And the money's there, and we're about to do it, and we're going through the approval process, and the leader of the community organization says, okay, you're going to do this now, but can you promise me, can you promise me that when you come in and spend all this money and it gets beautiful here, that I'm going to get to stay? that my relatives are going to get to stay, that my community is going to get to stay. Can you promise me that when you spend all this money on the climate security and make the city look that beautiful, that this isn't just going to be the next thing that makes gentrification happen? And I couldn't say that I could promise that. And that's another challenge, right? Dealing with this issue about equity as we gear up for this new age of climate. So this is relevant to you for a bunch of reasons. You're American, you're vested in New York. But also, many of you might not know this, the Rebuild by Design competition that started in New York kind of morphed and became a national competition a few years ago that HUD brought through with support of the Rockefeller Foundation. And as of a few months ago, it was publicly announced that uh, the Bay Area now has a Resilient by Design competition that is going to mimic, in many ways, the structure of the Rebuild by Design competition. It's a, it's a competition that's designed to generate, to spark exciting ideas about how to rebuild and innovate an infrastructure that will work for the Bay Area in the 21st century. And the new... Um, Managing Director Amanda is sitting in the first row, and she's going to be running this project. So make sure you come and talk to her. There's one catch about the um, Bay Area Resilient by Design competition, and that is that there's not a billion and a half dollars guaranteed to fund the projects afterwards. So after they come up with these great design ideas, through a process that's got several million dollars of funding, the cities and the state are then, and the teams are going to have to go out and try to find sources of funding, but that'll happen because it's the Bay Area and you guys do things here. So um, I talked for probably longer than I wanted to. I noticed a bunch of long now people trying to throw things at me while I was up here, but um, I hope you don't mind me going a little bit long. Um, I think this is the challenge of a lifetime. You know, I think this is the challenge of our moment. And we have a lot of issues on the table right now. There's a lot of, you know, kind of issues that feel very urgent in the country every day. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with immigration. I don't know what's going to happen to the Constitution. Um, but no matter what um, this climate, no matter what we say in the White House, no matter how much we fund scientific organizations, um, we are going to be living with this challenge. And it might not always feel like it's the most urgent thing at the moment, but our challenge is that the moment when climate change feels like the most urgent thing, it will be too late to do anything about it. So people like us, um, who have the luxury of spending a night in a beautiful bar in a beautiful city talking about ideas, um, I think should, should take that luxury and use it as um, a moment, an opportunity to do something great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We're going we're to try and get a couple quick questions in. Rio's uh, in the back there with the mic. Uh, Eric, let me ask you a question. We yeah. talked about a couple specific cities. Um, more generally about cities, cities seem to be both a point where there can be massive disasters, a concentration of resources and of people. So they are both kind of more vulnerable to become a giant disaster, but also could prepare and whatever. Do you have thoughts kind of more generally about, um, about what approaches or, or other examples you're seeing of what cities are doing to prepare? We're talking more about the way things have, have reacted. What, what do you see? Are there trends you see? What else can you say about sure, that? So, so it really depends on the kind of city. Um, one of the most vulnerable places on earth is Bangladesh. Um, you know, heavily urbanized, very dense population, uh, completely vulnerable to extreme weather events, you know, especially um, you know, massive uh, and immediate flooding. And 
you know, some of the most innovative and life-saving programs in Bangladesh involve things like teaching women and children to swim. Um, that's an adaptation strategy. Um, providing basic life skills that people need to um, survive situations where, in the past, they've been left to fend for themselves. And you know, several relief organizations have managed to work on this and reduce the mortality by tens of thousands of people in recent events. So it goes from kind of really like baseline skill level work, um, you know, to places like Singapore that are so completely vulnerable to the elements and are, you know, these kind of island nations that are dependent on, um, you know, st uh, nations around them uh, where they have no choice but to become technological leaders at, you know, building systems that are going to withstand, you know, massive downpour or they're going to be able to produce potable water. Um, so I see a lot of variation. I guess it kind of, I, I, it, it goes without saying, but I'll say it here because, you know, we're, we're, we're assembled, that cities um, can concentrate vulnerability, but at the same time, there's a very um, strong school of thought that thinks that, you know, we need to be urbanized, we need to live in more, denser, in more dense settlements um, because then we reduce our, our need for cars, for private automobiles, we can walk more places. Uh, you know, if you live in high-rise buildings, you probably have uh, much less demand for artificial cooling and heating. Um, and so, you know, there's a, you know, this writer David Owen who says there's nothing greener than tar. Um, and that's, that's probably right in some ways, although I think as we look at this question more closely, we realize, you know, if you live in a city like San Francisco or Manhattan, you, you shouldn't just pat yourself on the back for being awesome because, you know, you have this incredible, you know, condo. If you, con if you consume and travel the way that people in places like New York and San Francisco consume and travel, your individual carbon footprint is probably very, very high compared to other people on Earth. So um, uh, there you go. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting that Bangladesh example shows that not all the solutions are capital intensive. Sometimes they're population intensive and training. Well, right. So think right. about the Chicago example. I mean, there's, there's really low tech, you know, relatively inexpensive things that can keep a, a place uh, connected, and so you know, when I was working with the teams uh, around Sandy and Rebuild by Design, um, one of the architecture and engineering groups had this idea for building what they called resilience centers, and they wanted to to build like a new resilience building in every neighborhood, and it would you know be there in a crisis, and it would have a backup power generator, and it would have all this programming every day, and they had these really great ambitions for what this what it would mean to build a resilience center, and as it happened, just when we did that, they were talking about that, we walked by a neighborhood library. And I said, there's your resilience center. Go into any neighborhood. For, I mean, one of the great things, if you go into any city, there's a neighborhood library in that city that people of all ages use all the time for a range of different things. They trust the people who are there. The ethic of the library is come in. We're not going to ask you for ID. You, know, you have to work so hard to get kicked out of a library. Like you really, you have to like devise the most evil plan to get kicked out of a library. Like everybody in the library is there to help you. And, and so if instead of building a brand new resilience center, we said like, how could we update our libraries in cities so that every branch system, you know, ha was not just welcoming all the time, was not just a more pleasant environment, maybe we'd add bathrooms because they all need more bathrooms. Um, but also, you know, they would have more flexible space that could be converted into a relief center. They would all have backup power. They'd all have a wireless mesh network so that you could get internet access when systems were down. Like, we have some facilities in place that we could just build up a little bit more, and that doesn't cost a trillion dollars. All right, we've got a question back yes, there. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Eric, I really appreciated your talk. You are talking straightforward, and I really, really like that. But you, we're going to talk about the long-term problems of climate yeah. change, and I'd like to put that in one context. Last year, we passed 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In my mind, the likelihood that we'll ever see that again would be maybe in 100,000 years, because we are not really addressing the mitigation that we need to. Yeah. When the Earth was last at 400 parts per million was about 3, billion, 3 million years ago in the mid Pliocene, and sea level would be about where those lights are. That would be the low part, 15 meters, 50 feet above sea level, up to 85 feet above sea level. To stop that is likely impossible, but we could maybe make it a little lower if we work our asses off and really come together, like Saul Griffith said, 
this is like World War II, but with all the combatants on the same side. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Well, so I want to, I want to make it clear that um, I, you are right, that that is the most urgent problem we face, that all of this stuff is kind of is secondary to mitigation. So you can only mitigate so much, right? So if we, if, we get, if we get to the point where we're on the red line in the slide I showed you before, it's all commentary because we have such massive changes to the places that we've settled and to our, the systems that, that uphold us that, um, you know, like we'll all be thanking Elon Musk for that SpaceX stuff that gets us to another place. Um, it was really exciting to learn that they just discovered planets that possibly host life. I was like, just in time, you know? Um, um, so, um, so, so I, I, think that's, I think you're right about mitigation. So I think that we all know what the bad news is, right? Um, the good news is that this conversion to renewables is happening, and it's kind of happening no matter what we do. It's, you know, we could make it happen more slowly, and we can depress the market um, for you know, electric cars and for other renewable sources of energy, uh, wind and solar here. And certainly, you know, I predict that this administration we have now will do that. Um, but the trend is turning, and it's getting to the point where the costs of conversion are relatively low. Now, we're going to have to rebuild power grids, and you can't do that if you don't have major federal investment. And so at some point, some, something has to happen that I can't quite anticipate. But there is a part of me that you know, doesn't think we're quite that stupid, um, that, that thinks that it, it's, it's going to happen. And the question is just, you know, when? And so, so what, I, what I did in my own work is I said, all right, this is going to be the thing that I, I own. You know, like, I don't own the problem, but this will be my, this will, I'll make this my life's work right now. I will work on this issue. And what the climate scientists I know say is, look, we're out there on our own at this point. You know, we had so many tough questions 30 years ago, and we've just spent all this time fighting really brutal political battles, trying to establish the basic science about what's happening in our environment. And now we have all these puzzles that are social and behavioral, and we need your help. So will you social scientists kind of come up to the plate? And so the, reason, you know, the thing I'm doing at the Center for Advanced Study at Stanford this year is trying to work with Stanford to build a program um, that will really kind of bring more social scientists into the world of, of this climate change debate. And it's a hard thing to do because of the, you know, kind of historic uh, hierarchies of the disciplines where, like I said in the beginning, the environmental stuff is marginalized and the high status stuff is dealing with other problems. But we're trying to say, you know, it's time for us to join the world. So that's our modest way of helping. And, and you're working on a book about social infrastructure? I'm working on a right? book that's about what I call social infrastructure, which you know, hits on many of the themes from tonight, but explore some other ones as well. What's the timeline looking like? Are you God, at the beginning of that? You never or? ask that to an author. You host the whole damn series and you ask questions We're like long -term that. We're long-term thinkers. We always yeah. just say it's not done so yet. It's coming, so, coming yeah, soon that's fine. to a theater yeah. near okay. you. I'm, okay. I'm working All hard, right. man. All right. I got a guy from the center You took here. the night off, so I wasn't sure. He's going to go tell the boss. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Got a... Um, I have a question just on a slightly more modular version yeah. of the... You know, there's there's one mode of thought where you build the wall around all of Lower Manhattan. Um, there's also one where you build into building codes um, that they have to be flood resistant. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, you know, I live in, I moved into a building in Sausalito about 10 years ago, and we were putting a machine shop into the first floor right on the water, and the very first thing we did was put in floodgates, yeah. and we've had to raise them probably 15 times in 10 years. Um, and they've kept the water out. And so that was vastly cheaper than even paying the insurance premiums had they been flooded. Yeah. Um, but in the United States, we generally kind of work on this mode of we wait for the flood to happen, then we insure it, but then the insurance companies go out of business because they all get insured. Um, instead of paying you know, a few thousand dollars on the yeah. front end, but you know, we did do things like the ADA, um, which cost you know, at least on the order of magnitude as it would cost to... Um, kind of flood-proof most buildings. Yep. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've seen any efforts that are on this more modular effort where you just say, you know, like the earthquake uh, retrofits that happen here in San Francisco or something like that. Okay, yes, absolutely. And this is a very important point. Um, but um, two, two issues. First issue is 
we have a, you know, a lot of these areas that are most vulnerable are very heavily built up already, right? And there's a lot of subsurface infrastructure that's hard to elevate and protect. So the price tag for keeping the subway system dry in New York City is incredibly high. And the price tag for updating the power grid is incredibly high. And if you think about all those high rises that are completely vulnerable, you know, in, in San Francisco and Manhattan and, you know, you name your city, um, it's, it's, it's not as easy an update, or, you know, as it is here. So, so it's, it's, it is challenging to do it. But let me, so here's, a, here's another political leadership thing. So another thing that President Obama did not long before, about a year before he left office, is he said, um, you know, another rule that you could not get federal funds for any kind of rebuilding project, you know, whether it's a, a house or a piece of infrastructure, uh, if you didn't uh, have an estimate for um, sea level rise that would um, attune you to the kinds of um, vulnerabilities in the place where the, you know, the structure is. And you'd have to, you know, build to code in anticipation of, you know, sea level rise for X time horizon. And that had very, that was a very high stakes decision for the way that federal money went, especially for these larger infrastructure projects, right? So now we're in this really interesting situation. We have a president who says, you know, he's going to find a trillion dollars to spend on infrastructure. Maybe it's going to be 500 billion. I don't know what it's going to be. It could be public money. It could be private money. But if the policy on climate is to say climate change is not real, you know, it's a theory, he might also say then we don't have to take those things into consideration, in which case we might start building very expensive infrastructure without taking sea level rise into account. So back to the long consideration, when you read a story about an infrastructure project that the United States is taking on, so highway, tunnel, bridge, transit, think about the New York City subway system or the water system in San Francisco. You know, and, and think about how long we want our infrastructure to last. And if we start to build those structures, if we site those structures, if we compose those structures, design those structures without taking into consideration a trend in the climate that we know is happening, we're gonna, we're gonna just burn that money. We're just gonna burn the money the way they burnt their money in New York with that subway. So it's totally an app question. But you do have the opportunity as a regional government to in place, put at least some of those. M maybe. I mean, w what's at stake in this fight between Pruitt and the state of California is Pruitt saying, you know, you know this is on emission standards. But, you know, that it's, you know, Pruitt seems to be saying that he wants to challenge the state of California's right to have its own standards for emissions, which were there because they're the grandfathered in, right? Pruitt, Pruitt has indicated that he wants to make, have a legal fight against the state of California so that California can have its own standards. So I don't know where that's going to play out. Um, and, you know, one of, I, one of my jobs, and I think one of the jobs of you know, anyone who's really concerned about this issue, is to, th and, and like, I'm a sociologist, so I have not cracked this problem, how do you make issues like this feel alive and urgent and relevant so that we can talk about them in politics in the same way that we talk about Trump's tweets? You know? It's really a hard thing. I mean, this, I, I, like, I invite and plead with you to it, help us think about how to deal with this. Like, it's such a hard problem for people to get their minds around. You know? It is so hard to convey urgency and drama and significance, right? So we have these disasters as resources because like, so, so Chicago had this heat wave and 700 plus people died, but it wasn't spectacular. It didn't make for good television. Who cares about Chicago? And, and it, it didn't. Kind of, it, you know, so it's so it a non-event. So then you have this spectacular storm that hits New York City, that scares Washington DC, that scares Boston, it right, hits the power corridor of New York. Far fewer people die, but there's tens of billions of dollars in damage and incredible television. And you know now every government official and 
philanthropic leader and business owner in the region is suddenly attuned to climate change. And so like, there were years after that when my institute, like, I, I wish I was still in this moment, but we couldn't take any more money because everybody wanted to do stuff and there just weren't enough organizations that were doing this work. And now I fear that we've kind of forgotten about that. And I get how urgent all the other stuff is. I'm not saying like, don't worry about this whole immigration thing, it's gonna be fine. I don't feel that way at all. Um, but I don't want us to forget about this. All right, we're gonna have to, to leave it there, but Eric, you're gonna stick around. Sure, yeah. Um, a reminder, we have copies of Eric's book. He's gonna be signing the book. He's gonna be happy to take more of your questions, continue this discussion, things about states' rights and the different, stuff, yeah. different uh, coverability of different types of disasters. Um, so please stick around and uh, thank you again so much for, for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a Long Now Challenge Coins, a little token of our thanks for, for speaking. Great. One more time, a round of applause for Eric and thank, thank you. you. Thank you.